Hello. Hello, welcome everyone. We will start really soon. Uh, we are just waiting a few minutes to have uh, everyone there. So many robotics enthusiasts in the audience. Where do you come from? Yeah, that's a nice question. Don't hesitate to write it down on the chat. We are in Paris, for example. It's 4 p.m. there. I don't know if someone has another, uh, like a... It's 6 p.m. here in Turkey. Ah, 6 p.m.? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we have uh, people from, uh, I don't know, Boston. It must be, I don't know. I never know, like, it's, if it's late there. Or... <laughs> From Zurich, Berlin. <laughs> 7 a.m. 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Too early, yeah. <laughs> hey, I heard I am the star of today's presentation. So excited. <gasps> You're spoiling it, Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Oslo. I wanted to go there. Michigan. Ah, someone from Turkey. Actually, you must uh, have a, a travel a lot, no, Baha, during your uh, for your PhD, no? Yeah, yeah. I've been to um, Colombia, uh, to Bogota. I've been to US, Vienna, uh, France, UK. I've been um, all over. <laughs> it was so fun. Nice. I love traveling. I miss traveling because of the, the COVID. Oh. Yeah, yeah, true. Now we are traveling uh, virtually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but this way everyone can join, right? Exactly. Like. Yeah, that's also something fun that I, uh, like all the, the conferences. Actually, I am afraid of playing, for example. So, but now I can go to uh, conferences like uh, happening in US or uh, in India <laughs> without any issues. Yeah, <laughs> I do miss the like the in-person interactions though. We can't really have that with uh, virtual meetings. Yeah, true. They try to, to do some like, um, you know, virtual coffee and some uh, mm -hmm. conferences, something uh, of fun, but uh, yeah. I also miss the in-person uh, talk. Oh, hello everyone. So excited to see many people are joining us. What a nice way to be updated with the latest work on research and technology, right? I'm Pepper, by the way, and I'm happy to introduce the first Tech Talk of the Hard series that is being hosted here at SoftBank Robotics Europe. We will discuss the challenges and solutions to ensure long-term interactions between humans and robots, like me. So, I will let the floor to our host to tell you more about it. Enjoy. Thank you, Pepper. So, okay, we are starting. And uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, first Tech Talk of the Heart series. Uh, for this tech talk, I'm very glad to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Baha Irfan. I hope I'm saying it well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Baha did her PhD here at Sobank Robotics Europe and at the University of Plymouth in the joint Marie Curie ITN project called April. And uh, by the way, congratulations on your defense uh, yeah, a few days ago. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and yeah, actually, I had the chance to meet you, Bahar, uh, here during the time you spent at SBRO. So I'm especially happy to host one of my former colleagues today. <laughs> um, alongside uh, your research, you worked at um, R&D Lab Associate at Disney Research. So we clearly want to know more about it. <laughs> And you're currently the coordinator and co-organizer of the workshop series LIP HRI, which stands for Lifelong Learning and Personalization in Long-Term Human-Robot Interaction. 
Uh, and today, you will tell us more about your work on multimodal personalization in long-term human-robot interaction. So I will now let the floor to you uh, whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Marie. Let me share my screen. And here we go. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to hide my video panel because I don't like to see myself when I'm doing a presentation. And OK, so let me let me start. Again, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here today to talk about my PhD work on the challenges of long-term robot interaction and the drawbacks and benefits of applying personalization to tackle those challenges. Oops. Okay. Imagine meeting an amazing person, but the next day he doesn't remember you and even does the exact same things as before. To you and to everyone. That's how current robots are, designed to impress only in the first interaction. But we're individuals, we have different needs, preferences and personalities. For instance, a little girl may want to play her favorite game with the robot, whereas her father may want to hear the news and his father may require his pills to be reminded. Thus to bring robots in our daily lives, we need adaptable systems that recognize us, learn from us and personalize us behaviors. For personalizing interactions in the real world, the user should be recognized fully autonomously, which requires learning and detecting new uses, as well as recognizing previously learned ones. This problem, known as open world recognition, is a very challenging problem with only a few available approaches. Moreover, users' appearances can change over time, for instance, with a new hairstyle. So adaptation, that is, online learning, is necessary. What's more is that face recognition by itself may not be reliable when the face is occluded, for instance, with a mask like you see there, or due to poor lighting conditions. So combining other modalities, even those that do not uniquely identify a user by itself, such as gender or age, known as soft biometrics, can help improve the user recognition accuracy. To our surprise, there didn't exist a user recognition algorithm that satisfies these criteria. That's why we built the Multimodal Incremental Bayesian Network, shortly MMIBN, which is the first method for sequential and incremental learning in open world user recognition that allows starting from a state without any known uses. It's also the first multimodal approach that combines a primary biometric, face recognition, with soft biometrics, gender, age, height, and time of interaction for open world user recognition in human robot interaction. It also allows online learning to adapt to the changes of the user's appearances and to improve the recognition over time. Our model can be applied to any robot with off-the-shelf or open-source identifiers, making it suitable for research and industrial applications. For instance, a personalized robot narrator can be designed on, based on the Pepper robot um, to provide personalized content and nonverbal emotional communication based on the user and their age. Corresponding with the proprietary algorithms of the Pepper robot can be used to obtain face recognition and gender, age, and height estimations, which can be combined with the ground truth values entered by the user during enrollment to provide reliable user recognition. Here's such an example. What's your name? Before, I would like to know more about you. What is your gender? You look very young. When were you born? How tall are you in centimeters? Ready? Three, two, one, cheese. Nice to meet you, Arturo. Hello, Arturo. It is nice to see you again. Could you confirm that it is you, please? Yes, it's me. Would you like to hear a news excerpt, Arturo? Yes. A Boston University neuroscientist fascinated by memory. Hello, Leslie. It is nice to see you again. Could you confirm that it is you, please? Would you like to hear a story, Leslie? Yes. She thought that maybe a match might warm her fingers. We evaluated our approach 
uh, with the long-term real world study. Fully autonomous personalization. Hello, um, Marta. It is nice to see you again. Could you confirm that it is you, please? We bring much needed sunshine to my day, Marta. We explored, and also I'll take again, uh, we explored the, uh, our model, uh, evaluated our model with a long term real world study with 14 participants at the research office um, at the University of Plymouth. The, we use the Pepper robot as shown in the video and uses top camera to uh, obtain images and to and uses proprietary algorithms to hold on. And use the proprietary algorithms to obtain biometric data in addition to face detection and tracking. The users fully uh, enrolled with the robot fully autonomously and incrementally and interacted with it whenever they pass by. Um, our study showed that their model is suitable for long term human robot interactions in the real world and that it improves recognition, offering up to a 4.4% increase compared to face recognition. Online learning was performed better in identifying new users, but it decreased the performance for known users. However, we had some concerns over the study. Because it was conducted at a research office, we had a small population with a narrow age range. That's why we were not sure whether the optimized uh, parameters or the results would generalize to larger populations. That's why we, uh, we created the multimodal long-term user recognition data set with 200 users based on the uh, IMDb Wiki data set, which has images of celebrities from events and movies. We use the Pepper's proprietary algorithms on the images from this data set to obtain face recognition and gender age estimations and, uh, and combined it with artificially generated height estimations and random and pattern uh, time of interactions with varying frequencies. We compared our, uh, our models to, to the base face recognition of the Pepper robot and its soft biometrics, as well as the open world recognition method named Extreme Reality Machine, shortly EVM. The results show that in contrast to our previous study, uh, where face recognition provided 80 to 90% recognition, um, with this data set, with a larger data set, the face recognition only Performed, performed very poorly and only achieved 27%, almost as low as soft biometrics. Whereas our models substantially and significantly improved the recognition, offering up to 48% recognition, outperforming all the baselines. We also saw that uh, the models generalized were well to larger populations, 100 and 200 users, with varying interaction patterns. However, again, online learning did not improve the accuracy of the, of the recognition. On the other hand, online learning decreased the recognition bias caused by face recognition by equalizing the performance between users, which is highly important for diversity. While face recognition identified most users as new, thus correctly identifying new users, using multimodal information um, increased the chances of mixing the, uh, the enrolled users with the new, the new users with the enrolled users, thus um, decreasing the performance for new users. One option could be to combine other primary biometrics such as a user's voice or uh, other soft biometrics um, such as uh, a person's posture, for instance, or uh, use identifiers with a high reliability and lower noise, which could also help improve the online recognition. How, uh, having built a user recognition algorithm, we can move on to the personalizing the interaction to recalling previously learned information. The most natural way to acquire and convey information to achieve personalization is through dialogue. Recent advancements in text-based chatbots, uh, such as Facebook's Blender or Google's Mina, has been nearing um, human level performance. However, um, conversations with the robot are more challenging because users may assume multimodal capabilities, such as speech, vision and gestures, in addition to expect the robot to remember them and recall previous interactions. Um, what's more is that the human speech may contain grammatical errors, various accents and restarts, which makes it more challenging. Most of the literature in human robot interaction bypasses these issues using either touchscreen interfaces or um, teleoperated robots or use rule-based architectures in structured task-oriented dialogues 
um, to match the user's phrases to predefined templates. We decided to explore both types of architectures, that is rule-based and data-driven architectures, um, to, uh, on the, or using a personalized barista robot because personalization has been shown to improve customer experience in service robotics. In order to have a set of rules for the, uh, for the rule-based system and uh, training data for the neural networks, we, create, we artificially created the barista data sets, one which uh, has con contains simulated interactions with the, uh, with the barista and another with the personalized long-term interactions where the barista would recognize the user and learn and recall their previous orders to suggest their most frequent order. This is also the first data set to explore user-specific personalization in long-term task-oriented interactions. The data set also contains incorrect recognitions and recalls to handle such situations in the real world. We created the um, Barista, the Barista robot based on the adaptive paper robot shown on the left uh, that has an improved microphone system. The, um, we used a, we, we developed a rule-based dialogue manager based on the template matching on the Barista data sets and use automatic online um, speech recognition without, uh, without constraints using Google speech recognition. We personalize the interaction by recognizing users using our user recognition model and uh, suggesting their most frequent order like in the Barista data sets. Here's an excerpt. Uh, we, um, we conducted a real world, long term real world study, the first long term real world study that explores fully autonomous personalization in dialogue uh, at the International stu uh, Student Campus in Paris for five days with 18 non native English speakers. Here's an excerpt from the study where you can see the, um, the, burst, the personalized barista recognizes the users correctly and recalls their previous order, but the user wants to order something else. We experienced several challenges that negatively affected the user experience, and mostly due to unreliable speech recognition, as you could see from the video, which was affected by weak internet connection, quietly speaking users, um, short sentences, and pronunciation errors. In addition, um, the inflexibility of the rule-based approach uh, to the responses in the to the user's responses that are not in the templates created uh, problems, created failures in the interactions. Moreover, the users did not realize when the robot incorrectly recognized them, thus resulting in increasing inaccuracies in user recognition and learning preferences. In fact, users in the personalized robot condition had a lower number of successful interactions, but the, uh, they enjoyed the experience more, uh, looked forward to the next one, and wanted to interact with the robot as a real-world barista, uh, which shows that personalization mitigates the negative user experience. However, use, um, customers at the real world coffee shop may be less patient. So we need more um, fully, more robust systems for um, providing fully autonomous personalization um, in dialogue um, at, for deploying robots in the real world. For instance, the automatic speech recognition can be improved by um, higher quality, using higher quality microphones and um, onboard, uh, onboard automatic speech recognition systems or reliable internet connection or constraining the, um, auto uh, the grammar of the automatic speech recognition to the available templates that can come up 
in a conversation, like for instance, using the burst of data set templates and confirming the user's um, order at each step instead of confirming at the very end to avoid confusions. Similarly, explicit confirmation of the user's identity is necessary to avoid user and system errors in online learning. Another direction could be to personalize the interaction based on the natural language of the user, the native language of the user, um, to avoid errors in pronunciation. Finally, um, the data-driven architectures can be used to um, allow more flexibility in the user's responses. However, no previous study has explored data-driven architectures in user-specific personalization. That's why we evaluated the state-of-the-art data-driven dialogue architectures, namely supervised embeddings, sequence-to-sequence -sequence networks, sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models, and end-to-end -end memory networks and their variants on the Barista datasets. And the results show that some of the models, especially sequence-to-sequence, -sequence, achieve near-perfect accuracy in generic task-oriented dialogue whereas um, they received um, insufficient performance. They didn't uh, perform sufficiently well to be deployed in personalized long-term dialogue, achieving only 70% recognition. Uh, in addition, the, the, the reason was that the models were unable to learn new names and entities, um, which prevented incremental learning of the preferences, pre preferences, even when the preference information was provided to these models. Um, one option can be to, um, to uh, retrain the memory networks because you achieved best uh, performance in personalized long-term interactions and to incrementally expand the memory when a new user is introduced or a new user item, a new uh, order item is made by the, uh, by the user, um, which could be done because uh, the training is relatively low for memory networks and that the model is able to generate fast responses so it can be used in real-time interactions. Another possible solution could be to use a probabilistic approach such, such as partially observable micro decision process to the better detect the correct dialogue state, state and to recover, uh, recover from speech recognition errors. Such a, uh, such a model can also be used for emotional language adaptation. Um, for within and throughout, uh, within short-term di dialogues and long-term interactions to provide personalized and engaging dialogue in therapy, education, or entertainment domains with, uh, with multiple people, which we apply to storytelling at Disney Research Los Angeles. Another um, use of the emotions can be to detect the user's satisfaction with the responses to detect the correctness of the, uh, of the given response. Um, Moreover, most of the systems, most of the uh, commercially available or publicly available systems such as Alexa and Siri are often a combination of rule-based approaches to extract um, information through common queries, as well as probabilistic approaches to provide robustness to noise and ambiguity and to learn from data. Another, appro uh, another area where personalization has been shown to have an impact is socially assisted robotics, and that's for care or rehabilitation or therapy processes. Um, so which uh, implies that the robots can, a, a social robot, a personalized social robot can be used for uh, improving motivation and preventing dropouts in long-term cardiac rehabilitation programs, um, which offer, which aim to accelerate recovery after experiencing a cardiovascular event through exercise and education. The robot can also help uh, continuously monitor the patients during large groups, thereby helping clinicians and in providing more individualized, um, individualized care and probably detecting critical conditions. That's why together with medical specialists and a research team in Colombia, we designed a socially assisted robot for the second phase of cardiac rehabilitation, which lasts 18 weeks with intended sessions twice per week. We use a now robot as shown in the image um, and a set of senses to detect, uh, to uh, track the patient's health levels, provide immediate feedback and alert the medical team if the heart rate or tiredness reach critical levels. We personalize the interaction by recognizing users through our user recognition model, MMIBN, and using their name and tracking and providing feedback on their adherence and progress throughout the program. We deploy these robots for, uh, at a 
um, at a uh, hospital in Colombia for cl clinical therapy lasting two and a half years um, to, um, to detect, to evaluate um, the effects of using a socially assisted robot and personalization in comparison to conventional cardiac rehabilitation program, thereby having three conditions, a generic social robot, a personalized robot, and a control condition for conventional therapy. The, um, the robot recognized the users at the beginning of their interactions and um, provided adherence feedback. For instance, if it's the first session of a uh, first session of a week, the robot would say, oh, I hope you had a nice weekend to improve its sociability. If the patient didn't come to the previous session, it would comment such as, you didn't come to a previous session, I hope everything is all right for you. And then um, it would provide the Session, current session intensity param, exercise intensity parameters, which are the speed and inclination of the treadmill, and compares intensity to the previous session. I'll show the video right now, uh, so I need to stop my uh, change screen sharing. Yes. Can you see the video? I'm guessing yes. And in addition, the patient also commented on the previous session progr progress of the uh, patient at the beginning of the session and gave a uh, motivation for the current session. For instance, um, the robot could say, uh, you, you experienced a, a difficulty with your heart rate at the previous session, but I'm sure everything's going to be fine this time. Uh, at the end of the session, the current um, session progress was also compared to the previous session and further motivation was provided based on the intensity and the per, per patient's progress to, uh, to inform the patient on how they're, uh, how they're progressing throughout their rehabilitation on a session by session basis. Throughout the program, patients had various types of interactions with the robot, such as um, through a pull request. <laughs> gazing at the robot it, during and even after a session, smiling at him, talking to it, talking about the benefits of the patient. Oops. Yes. And um, the results showed that. Yeah. Uh -huh. The results showed that. Yes. So sorry, but uh, we could not see the, the, last, uh, the, the last two videos. Oh, you couldn't. OK. This ones, or just the whole videos? Uh, the one with the no, the first one we saw, but the one with the smile and the gaze. Okay. Uh, the gaze, uh, the gaze. Okay, smile. It's. You can see it. Um, okay. Still not. No, that's weird. No, what we see is the VLC. Um, oh, okay. Media Sorry player. About that. <laughs> I'll just close that. Okay. And okay. Can you see it now? Ah, uh, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that. No problem. All right. So I'll repeat it again, just in case. Um, so the patient um, corrected their posture. That it looks straight when the when the robot requested them. The, rob uh, the patient stays at the robot even and during after a session. And they smile at it, talk to it. <laughs> and talk about its benefits to other patients. Um, the, the results show that uh, 
the robots, having a, a robot and continuous monitoring actually um, was very beneficial for the clinicians to, to um, provide, to detect, promptly detecting um, the critical conditions and which even helped save a person's life throughout the study. Uh, in addition, these, the continu continuous monitoring helped provide high intensity um, exercises such as high speed and inclination, as you can see in the precise condition, as well as um, using it, uh, having being assisted by a robot, whether it be generic or social ro uh, or a personalized robot, improved the cardiovascular functioning of the patients more than the conventional cardiac uh, program. The patients also com uh, completed their programs in a, um, a faster, uh, in a shorter duration than the conventional cardiac rehabilitation, the control condition, basically, uh, which suggests benefits on adherence. Uh, however, uh, sorry. okay. However, um, we, due to the COVID, uh, the outbreak of COVID nineteen and the um, dropouts throughout the program. We actually had less patients than we initially started with. We had we started with 43 patients, 15 for controls and social each, and 13 for personalized. Whereas we had nine patients only completing the control condition, 11 con uh, patients in the social robot condition, and only six patients in the con uh, in the personalized robot condition, especially due to the COVID-19. So further studies are necessary to. Um, confirm these effects, even though most of the uh, effects were significant. And throughout the program, personalization elicited and maintained um, uh, the interactions with the with the robot and they in the user engagement, um, after, especially after the first stage uh, of the interactions. Um, in addition, the personalization features were highly positively perceived and this perception was maintained in the long term. The patients also uh, stated that they felt confident doing the therapy with the robot because it's personalized and continuously monitored them or their progress and that they expressed that it motivates them and that it makes them feel happy. However, um, apply, uh, relying on full autonomy uh, uh, for personalization in the real world uh, rehabilitation program of course, had its uh, drawbacks because um, the malfunctioning of the sensors and the low visual recognition decreased the perceived utility of the, ro uh, of the personalized robot. Um, we could, of course, remove user recognition to overcome this problem, but um, the, the video analysis and the questionnaires actually show that the patients enjoyed being recognized and the, uh, in, removing the user recognition could reduce the naturalness of the interaction. Um, in addition, pre, uh, similar to our previous study with the birth robot, we, the highly positive perceptions of the personalized robot, despite these um, failure, uh, this, uh, malfunctions, uh, show that personalization helped overcome the negative user experience of the, of the users. And nonetheless, to deploy robots in the real world rehabilitation, we need um, more robust systems. And to, we also should improve um, the adaptation, the personalization features uh, to decrease uh, the, and decrease their repeatability as suggested by the patients. Uh, for instance, through um, adapting the feedback based on their uh, sensory levels, such as um, fatigue levels, or uh, providing an overall fee uh, progress feedback instead of session by session to, pro um, to provide more engaging and informative rehabilitation. Overall, our, um, our studies or the whole research show that personalization helps improve the user experience and long-term robot interaction, which suggests that if the future lies with robots, personalization is the key to unlocking long-lasting and pleasant interactions that can meet our expectations. So um, it's, it's not possible to tell everything in 30 minutes about personalization or long-term robot interactions. So if you'd like to more learn more about it, um, you're more than uh, welcome to the lifelong learning and personalization in long-term robot interaction workshop, LEAP HRI, to provide a LEAP in HRI, um, at the, as part of the HR 2021 conference on the 8th of March, where we'll have discussions with experts uh, from industry and academia. 
and my co-organizers and I are going to bring you an amazing program and which will hope to, uh, which I hope to work your time and the relatively small fee required to register for the workshop. We also previously organize, uh, part of the organization teams also organize the lifelong learning um, in long-term interaction at Roman and personalization long-term interaction at HR 2019, so uh, which all had uh, a great success. Before I finish my talk, I would like to thank the ama my amazing um, and wonderful supervisors during my PhD, Tony, Natalia, and Mikhail, as well as uh, my great supervisor um, at Disney Research made it a really uh, enjoyable town internship with James, um, as well as my research intern um, at Software Robotics Europe, Metti, and its co-supervisor, Alexander Mazel, um, to for designing a burst robot and, pro, and, and conducting real world studies. In addition to Asmina for um, co her collaboration in designing a personalized narrator robot. And finally, to my three and a half years collaborators um, for the personalized social assistant robot project, Manuel, the whole research team at Columbia, Natalia, Jonathan, Carlos, Marcella, and the pioneering medical specialists, Monica and Luisa. In addition to, our, to, to the patients and participants that attended our studies um, for their time and efforts, the funding agencies, Mars Cross Carry Actions Project, April, and Royal Academy of Engineering for this project um, for the funding, and um, the University of Plymouth and Software and Robotics Europe for providing a great research environment. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, if, you're, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now or later through email. And the repositories are currently private, but if you're, if you're interested, just send me an email. I'll be happy to share you the early access version um, be uh, before my journal papers are out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Baha, for your talk. Really cool, really interesting. <laughs> I really love this topic, actually. <laughs> And I think we will have some, yeah, some question. Uh, of the, I, did I stop the, my screen sharing? Okay, perfect. Yeah, already done. <laughs> good, good, good. I am happy to answer questions, like I said. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so uh, we already have one. Uh, so you studied long-term at HRI in various domains, health, service, etc. In your opinion, in which domain do those robots have the most potential and why? And what about robotics, for instance? Great, great question. Um, honestly, it's a, great, it's a great question. It's also a, a difficult one because I think it, they all have potential. Uh, it depends on you, uh, what you want. And the reason that I chose service robotics and social assisted robotics is that, is that it has a one-to-many structure, basically. Um, for instance, for service robotics, it could help multiple people. You could have multiple people with one robot. And same for social assisted robotics. If you if you were to um, use, a, for instance, a pepper robot for the um, cardiac rehabilitation therapy, you could actually um, simultaneously um, monitor all the patients in a large group. That's why they're therefore helping many patients at the same time. So I believe um, both health and service are, are really important and it will have um, a real uh, impact in the future because future is going to, it's going to be robots eventually. And we need, if you're going to have, you're going to see those robots over and over again, um, especially for long-term interactions, we, uh, we need the personalization to actually keep an interaction, keep uh, going with an interaction. If I were to choose, I would say health uh, because um, it, it has a real impact in the pe people's life. Um, as I said, one uh, the personalized robots it could be the it could be the social robot that also helps this, but the personalized robot help detect a critical uh, solution, uh, the critical heart rate, which um, help enables uh, the the uh, doctors to promptly detect the the condition and decrease the session intensity, and then later refer that person to. Um, to surgery and thereby saving his life at that very moment, at that very second. And it's, it was, it, it's amazing to see that it has a, a perfect impact, uh, a real time impact, a real impact and on, on the person's life, uh, for instance. For cobots, um, it, it's, 
it could yeah, actually be important as well because you need to adapt to your interaction. Uh, so it wouldn't be, I would say, social in that perspective, but uh, behavior, uh, behavioral personalization and adaptation is definitely necessary for cobots to, um, to do a tier of mind, to, uh, to model the persons and what their person's thinking and adapt their interaction accordingly. Yeah. I hope yeah. I answered your question. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, so thanks for the presentation. Did you find differences between now and Pepper in the human robot interaction studies? Yes, uh, we didn't compare now and Pepper, um, but one of the patients uh, in the social assistive uh, robotics, the cardiac rehabilitation study, uh, actually uh, thought that the now was very childish and the sound was childish and didn't find it uh, suitable for adult interaction. Now, now generally it's um, used in education for that reason. It looks like a small child, so it's generally used in education or um, uh, for instance, for childcare uh, domains um, in assistive domains. Um, whereas we, we use it with adults with um, over 40 to 80 years old. So uh, only one of them actually commented on the robot's appearance though. So it could have an effect and definitely um, if we were to put a pepper there, maybe we could have had a different uh, overall um, effect on the patients. But over time, I guess um, those people get really bonded with the robots. And we had a question on the personalized robot uh, questionnaire. We asked, um, do you feel attached to the robot? And actually if, uh, several patients said yes, uh, that they, and there was a patient um, that was really, uh, that was actually sad and said goodbye at their last rehabilitation session. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to see how people can bond with the robots, but definitely there will be differences on the appearances. And there are actually great studies that's been done before uh, that explores uh, these differences. Yeah, too. Uh, how long uh, was the study about uh, the, the, the timing uh, when the people said like uh, they, they're getting attached? Uh, it was 18 weeks. So um, for five, uh, over five months, uh, they, they saw the robot twice a week. Yeah. And uh, so it was, yeah, it was a long term, it was a real proper long term study and um, it, it was really nice. And they wanted to keep on like working with the robot. They recommended its use to other patients as well. And one interesting finding that uh, we saw that um, during, um, the, during the study to avoid any um, confounding effects, we only had one patient within a 20 patient group uh, in uh, cardiac rehabilitation that was working with the robot or with the, um, with the sensors and so on. And the other patients who saw uh, the person working with the robot actually came to the experimenters and wanted to participate in the study. They said, this robot looks great. This, the, uh, the advantages looks great. I actually want to participate. It's, it's, it's great. It's like the, you, you're encouraging uh, participation through uh, showing the robot, which, um, which is funny because people um, didn't expect the robots um, to be as good. They, they were afraid that it's going to uh, replace uh, clinicians. It's not possible. It's, uh, it's only beneficial to them. It's only supplementary to them. And, um, and they were not, uh, their expectations, you could see from my presentation, the focus group, their expectations were actually much lower than the patients with uh, the personalized robot or the social robot conditions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we have, yeah, a lot of questions coming. I don't know I'm if happy, we'll be I'm able happy to answer all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be so fun. I think uh, you can all ask a question. What, uh, if Baha, you agree? What we could do is also like uh, if we don't have time now, uh, mm -hmm. to to have a Q and A uh, on the blog post at the end also, so we can have time to really answer all the questions. Absolutely. Uh, cool. So next one is, uh, what are the future improvements to expect in uh, personalized learning? Oh, wow, difficult. <laughs> um, well, I suggested some of them uh, throughout my uh, talk, but um, uh, it depends on the area, I would say. Um, so definitely for dialogue, 
uh, we need to uh, we need to explore personalization more. As I said, um, uh, for instance, the data driven architectures that we um, explored only on the Barista data sets because you can't you can't put it directly in a real world interaction. It's it's not going to work, and we saw that it wouldn't even work even if it's just text oriented interactions. It could work. But uh, in generic test oriented dialogue, for instance, which had achieved great um, accuracies, why it wouldn't work for personalized interactions. So um, the feature improvements I would suggest uh, for personalized robots, uh, personalized learning, um, is continued learning, lifelong learning, uh, which is the, you're going to, you can see that if you come to the workshop. Uh, so it's um, lifelong learning in data driven architectures. Um, it's, it's, it's basically what I, similar to what I did with the user recognition. It's actually incremental learning of the knowledge and adapting it through online learning or um, batch learning uh, to improve, basically learn from the user on the go. And this is, this is, this, this needs to be done. You need to always for personalization, you need to learn on the go you need, because you can't, um, if you can't, Imagine you can't put all the rules, especially in open domain interaction. You can't put all the rules um, that um, that you expect to, for a person to do something in a task or interaction. It's easier. You know what the person is supposed to say. For instance, in a barista, you, you can personalize more easily in open domain dialogue. Then it, it's much more challenging because any the person can say anything. And in that sense, you, you need to both learn what the person is saying, understand what they're saying, and actually personalize in the interaction, actually um, refer, for instance, to a previous interaction and say, um, and comment on it and so on. So the open domain dialogue is, is the next level of challenge, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is really challenging, but at the same time, really, important too and i think that the next question is also like um, i have something also to do with uh, personalization um, uh, online uh, it's how multiple uh, personalities of a robot could affect the trust of the users let's say i just interacted with a robot at a shop that showed me one personality a few minutes later i see the robot interacting with someone else with a completely different personality what are your thoughts of this situation? Um, actually, at uh, Disney Research, we, we explored personality, two different personalities, a, a non-agreeable agent, um, which, was, um, it, which was interacting um, well, in an unagreeable tone, like um, trying to make them unhappy, uh, which was its purpose, basically, uh, or with, in comparison to an agreeable agent, uh, which had which was this whole uh, whole purpose in life to, is to be liked, is to be agreed with, is to have the person happy and be smiling and be loving them and so on. So we had like these two uh, personalities and the people were interacting with, the, uh, with one personality and then the other. And what we saw actually, which was very interesting, was that their perception of the agent, it was the same agent, but it had um, different... Um, different personalities but they were unaware of the uh, each other let's say um so and the, what we saw that people were actually changing their beliefs about the agent even though we told them they're different they they don't know you that uh, previous interaction you just ha had with that person that with that uh, not person that, that virtual agent does not apply to this one uh, but they um instead of for instance they agree they um they talk with the non-agreeable first and then to the agreeable they were like no i don't want to help you <laughs> even though the agreeable was like really trying to be liked so it definitely affects it i can tell you that um and uh i wouldn't say changed so maybe slight differences in personalities could be um the key or to have a, a personality that's um, actually a constant in actually in psychology, um, well, not in psychology, but um, in effective computing, personality mostly doesn't change, uh, but the um, emotions of the person uh, of the agent can actually change over time. So the and the mood as well and the uh, relationship with that person. So 
um, so you can have a more um, constant, um, more um, reliable and um, interaction with the person without a more believable interaction as well, without really um, getting off the fence uh, with the person. Uh, so, um, so I would say having a constant personality, but adapting those uh, relationships and emotions and the memories with the person with different per people is a better way than, it pro uh, than completely changing the personality uh, of the agent. And Maureen, you would, of course, have more uh, suggestions on the emotions part as well, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, empathy is really important too. And uh, yeah, uh, in this context, you can, uh, we, we do that. We don't change personality, but uh, we do uh, change our uh, emotional state based on the, the one of the person in front, yeah. And this is really important to have in social robotics. I totally agree. Um, oh, so back to uh, the uh, one of your first uh, work that you um, told us about is, were there any features that were particularly effective or ineffective for person identification? What identifying features should a social robot developers consider using that they are currently not? Great question. Uh, well, all of them are great, honestly. <laughs> um, yes, we actually looked into that. And in the, uh, in the first study, we actually saw that height was the most important uh, pr parameter and age was the least. Um, but that was also because um, the, there were, the, the population had very high, very tall and, uh, people, as well as the age, le, re, the age was actually quite close to each other. Uh, whereas on the, on the multimodal uh, long-term user recognition data sets, uh, we had more varying um, uh, age range from 10 to uh, 63, if I don't uh, recall it wrong. And, um, we all, uh, and there we saw actually the quite opposite, uh, that the height was not uh, that important and uh, it was age that mattered. I'm, hopefully I'm not saying this wrong. Um, and um, you can look at the paper. <laughs> uh, and yes, definitely some of, and the gender for instance, so time of interaction, I want to um, highlight that part, time of interaction. It could be useful if you have a pattern time of interaction, for instance, for rehabilitation, the patients are coming at certain uh, times every week, you know the patient's going to come at that time, so it's more informative. Whereas if you have, for instance, a companion robot, um, where the robot can see you at any time during the day, then the time of interaction actually is not good. Uh, so gender um, can also be important. Um, there is actually a, a YouTube video, you can find it um, with the face ID of Apple, and where the, the when the the mother of a of a male child is unlocking their phone because it's her phone and then giving it to a child and the child like ten years old unlocking male and unlocking the fa uh, the phone uh, it's because their facial features are quite close to each other uh, but you can overcome that with gender and using age so um, most definitely um, multimodal um, identification should be used instead of just fa uh, facial features and voice is very important. We didn't use it. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my own voice. <laughs> we didn't use it um, because there wasn't an open source, a reliable open source uh, speaker, reckon, uh, speaker identification algorithm at the beginning when we were first uh, starting the study. Um, it could be now, um, but it's definitely important and some studies also use it um, we didn't use fingerprint, for instance, fingerprint is very, very reliable, but you don't want to fingerprint a robot, basically. It's, it would re reduce exactly the naturalness of the interaction. And it, people also would, you know, this, this, this fingerprint is your identity. It's your, your uh, you can be tracked using your fingerprint. So you don't want to give that to a robot. Um, it's understandable. So I wouldn't say, uh, I would say don't use uh, fingerprint, uh, but you can definitely use voice and face and combine it with the, with the other uh, modalities um, as well. But time is a very, uh, is a very uh, con 
tricky, it's a tricky one at the time of interaction. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Multimodality is, is quite often the key in this kind of domain. But yeah, the fingerprint also like, uh, it's difficult when you have a physical robot, you want to use the, the sensor, but you don't want to oblige. Uh, you want to do it maybe passively and not uh, uh, actively. Um, so, but again, about this, uh, we yeah. were about going there about the privacy. So is there a way to enforce privacy in the design of the long-term interaction solutions? Um, I knew, I knew an ethics question was going to come up. It's always does, it's personalization. Um, definitely, um, what I suggest is to have um, onboard systems. So no cloud-based systems. Because uh, when, uh, when you put your um, information to a robot, you want that to stay with the robot, especially if you're giving personal information. Uh, you want it to stay on the robot and to be unlocked only when it's you, um, for instance, user recognition or maybe even password. But again, it's not natural of the interaction. Um, but you want uh, the robot to be the only one accessing it instead of the cloud um, where any researcher or maybe anyone if it's stolen or something can access. That's why I'm actually against um, cloud-based systems. I don't, um, I don't even have a Siri. I have it on my phone, but I never used it. Um, so I am actually, I'm one of those people that actually gets concerned about privacy issues. Um, so definitely it should be onboard systems and it should stay um, on the robot just, just on the robot and not go anywhere else that you don't know where it's going. Yeah, thank you for this, uh, this uh, answer. Um, so next question for the, the many to one issue, uh, what policy to switch between loading an appropriate behavioral model that matches the user's profile uh, three push to get acceptance according to Pentland versus long term fine tuning. Um, huh. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm having trouble understanding the question. Let me just reread it just to make sure. Yeah, no problem. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. I think I think I understand. Um, what I would suggest is to have, uh, this, is, this is similar to the personality question actually, um, to have um, one, um, one general model and per, uh, personalized on top of that general, uh, general model. For instance, um, with the, again, with the, uh, the Disney research, the personality that we created, um, the virtual agent, uh, personality virtual agent, it had um, a personality and it had a transition function uh, to understand how the users respond uh, to, um, to certain behaviors. So if the robot acted happily when the user was angry, does the user become happy or uh, move to a different state for instance, neutral? So it uh, collected those transitions uh, states and from there it could understand how Generally, users can respond um, by averaging all the information gathered from multiple users and also have specific models per people because everyone can have a different reaction to the robot. For instance, the, some person uh, can move from happy to angry very quickly, whereas another requires a more subtle change. And uh, so, so this way, the, the, the uh, agent could learn how it could um, uh, generally re react to achieve a certain, um, certain goal, for instance, basically improving itself over time, starting with a, with a, a, a point, starting with a transition function, a very generic transition function, and then per uh, personalizing that generic function to everyone, and also personalizing that function to person as well, uh, to individual base as well. So I would say, uh, the long-term fine-tuning is definitely uh, the way instead of, uh, but again, here it's actually matching, but in what, at one point matching and at one point generalizing. And so when it's um, actually um, interacts new users, it, it knows how people are going to react and then it can personalize over time for them as well. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, uh, I think, what time is it? It's already one hour. I think maybe we will get, uh, take one more question, maybe, and then uh, wrap it up. Um, alors, one of the challenges in, in long-term HRI is dealing with interpersonal differences of users. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. eager to chat with robot, there's a bit hesitant. Which interpersonal differences did you experience in your studies to have a big impact on how could personalization help? Um, we haven't looked into it uh, to the people's um, differences. We um, So that's, it's actually a, a critical issue with ethics. Um, so if we're evaluating people's uh, personalities, it's an ethical concern, um, but it, you could uh, have it uh, accepted for studies. But um, definitely it does have an uh, effect uh, because personal, uh, the, uh, as the question suggests, a person that's um, very willing to uh, interact with the robot is going to enjoy the experience more. But um, one uh, other thing is that this, um, the, the, when you do long-term studies, you actually get to see uh, how people actually change over time as well. So let's say, um, uh, go, go back to social assistive robotics study on this one. Um, so at the beginning of the interaction, at the beginning of the first study, people, yeah, people have high gaze and they're looking at the robot. It's, it's, it's new, right? It's new. You're going to look at the robot more often. But um, they were more um, uh, concerned and they didn't trust the robot well at the beginning. Whereas um, towards the end, um, they were, the, this is what the experimenters uh, told, told us as the project uh, collaborators. They, uh, they said that the people trusted the robot a lot and they, um, they trusted their, uh, the, when the robot said something to them. So basically over time, you um, get to bond with the robot and you get to trust the robot because you're, you're seeing all its um, malfunctioning and benefits. So you know, you get to know more how the robot and the robot gets to know more you if you do personalization. So um, it could, uh, those interpersonal differences can actually have a more, um, more of a difference in a short term interaction, um, except for the novelty effect, of, of course. But it, those uh, differences, the, the hesitant to talk to robot can actually change over time. And to imp uh, the person might be actually very willing to talk to a robot as well. So yeah, so definitely um, it should, this should be um, uh, investigated within long-term concept. And it would be a definitely a great uh, research direction as well. So they giving you more work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay, well, one last question. Um, because, yeah, so many, but don't worry, as we said, like, uh, uh, we will take time to, to get an answer to all of the questions. Um, do you think there are currently underexplored behaviors to personalize during long term human robot interaction? For example, degree of politeness of the robot, vocabulary choice, degrees of extraversion, et cetera. It's <laughs> if you don't have the time to answer. <laughs> um, do. uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, because personalization in long-term robot interaction is actually a, quite a new topic. Um, I mean, it's not very new, but the reason uh, the, uh, there, are, there aren't many people that's actually working on these topics. And most of, these, uh, most of those who's working on it is actually working on specific domains. So for instance, those um, that are work on only socially assisted robotics part, for instance, um, in personalization, I'm, th I'm thinking of Adriana Tapis and Maya Matarik, they're mostly focused on social assisted robotics. Of course, they're doing other types of as well. And there's experts, for instance, um, Tony, my supervisor, uh, focuses on education mostly. Uh, so um, there are many unexplored behaviors. Um, and um, yes, exactly, all those degree of politeness, the vocabulary choice um, could be a great direction as well, uh, depending on the task though, because in some tasks, uh, 
the personalization can actually decrease um, learning. For instance, um, look at ed uh, education. Um, remember uh, James Kennedy's paper that per the personalized the robot that personalized too much. Um, it could it actually decreased the learning rate, but improved the likability of the robot. And there is again degree of extroversion. This was uh, I, I I don't remember who worked on it, but there is um, I think a study on the extroverted introverted robots and comparing them. Uh, so the you uh, the please um, also come if you if you can uh, to the workshop uh, the Leap HRI workshop. There we will discuss a broad range of topics on personalization and lifelong learning. Uh, for instance, like that first question, there is um, co-bots uh, where you can apply lifelong learning. Uh, there is um, chatbots, like I, I suggested. There is um, companion robots and so on. So there's a broad range of areas where you can apply personalization. And, and, and it just, when you have a long-term interaction, it just improves it. It's, it's necessary with, um, with and it, the, the necessity for personalization, the what you should, the content of personalization depends on the area. But I guess in most cases, at least as far as I could see, it improves rec uh, the, the interaction. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you for the, you the answering all the questions. It was really inspiring and uh, for me and for uh, a lot of people, I think uh, long time, uh, long term uh, interaction with uh, with robot is really uh, one of the future to to really uh, look into. And it was a pleasure to have you, and you're always welcome uh, here with us. Uh, <laughs> thank and thank you, uh, everyone, to attend this uh, first uh, tech talk of Heart series. Don't forget to register to. Uh, Baha uh, workshop. <laughs> if you can, we'll put the link again uh, on the chat, and um, and yeah, and uh, we will try to uh, put uh, all to answer all the questions that was unanswered for now. Don't hesitate to mail us also if you have any suggestion for future topic and uh, future speakers. And uh, for us, stay tuned for our special event for the Women Day that will uh, start on the 8th of March. Uh, we are competing, Marie. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, true. <laughs> but it's okay, it's not a workshop for, uh, for us, so don't worry. It will no, be ours, ours, ours is in the US time, so it's actually going to be afternoon for, uh, for Europe. <clears throat> true. So, yeah, that, that, <laughs> could, that could overcome, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, well, but thank you, Baha, again, and thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Bye-bye. Yeah, ciao.